Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a particularly barfalicious performance of Bruckner. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're galloping down the midway as we speak. It's this horror show. Simon Rattle, the London Symphony Orchestra, Bruckner Symphony Number no. 7. This is a performance which hands down earns the white scarf of irredeemable chutzpah. I mean irredeemable chutzpah. Now, why is that? Well, it's on many levels. It operates on many levels. But what this claims to be, well, I guess what it is, you know, I think they're lying about it, is the, the Urtext edition by Benjamin Gunnar Kors, Benjamin Kors, who's a delightfully zany person, uh, published by the Verlagsgruppe Hermann, Vienna 2015. This is the world premiere recording of this Urtext version. Is it any different from any other Bruckner 7th that is audibly, notably significant? The answer is no. Negatory. Nunca. Niente. Nine. Not a bit. It's a joke. I mean, Benjamin Kors is the, is the, the uh, you know, gadfly of the standard Bruckner military industrial complex. Because as they churn out critical edition after critical edition after critical edition of every single symphony, he's there telling them that their whole methodology is wrong and that he's going to do his own or text competing critical edition thing of the Bruckner symphonies. And that's what he's doing. He's one of the guys who worked on the completion of the finale of Bruckner's ninth. Blech, right? So anyway, so that's what he's done for the Seventh Symphony. Now, the Seventh has never had any major textural issues. I mean, it is, it, it, there are, were no cuts. It's, it's been formally correct since the day Bruckner wrote it. It was his first big success when it was performed. The only issue is whether in the Adagio there is the climax including percussion, that is cymbals, triangle, and timpani, or not. That's it. Everything else has been basically the same. The differences between the Haas and the Novak edition, edition are basically questions of tempo, tiny details of articulation and phrasing, nothing that you will hear, nothing at all. However, however, Benjamin Coors has written an entire, oh, there's all kinds of notes to this. Here we go. Bruckner's Seven Symphonies reassessed. Did it need to be reassessed? Did anybody ask for it to be reassessed? Did you wake up one morning and say, holy crap, we need to reassess Bruckner's seventh because the current assessment, well, there's something wrong with it. There must be something wrong with it. It needs to be assessed. Ugh, gross. So it's being reassessed, and which is completely pointless. Yes? Okay. So then he talks about the Ur text. And, and let's see. Anton Bruckner, or text Gesamt Ausgabe. Let's see what he says here. Bruckner's own manuscripts contain very few errors in the musical text. Hmm. You would never know it to talk to the Bruckner people, would you? But every single smidge, every dot or comma or apostrophe requires a separate edition, right? The version of August 22, 1876 at 4 p.m. is different from the version of August 23, 1776, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? And each deserves its own complete score that you can record separately. Ugh. Anyway, he writes, Nevertheless, they present particular problems in terms of performance practice, performance practice, dynamic markings, articulation, tempi, because such instructions were only added as part of the last stage of work on a composition. This is true of practically everybody who writes music, folks. There is nothing new here. Uh, the, the complex source material demands that, in addition to the autograph manuscripts, the first copies, manuscript set of parts, first editions, corresponding galley proofs, and secondary documents are taken into consideration. 
this is what you do when you put together an or text edition. Or text is German, it means original text, which it's not, by the way, um, in most cases, but that's a whole nother question. It requires a certain amount of editorial decision making. And what, what Coors here is saying is that his decision making is better than everyone else's decision making. So you're having a fight between the decision-making people, between editorial principles or editorial standards. He continues, for the Anton Bruckner Ortext Complete Edition, Abuga, that's its initials, the Abuga, <coughs> uh, the Hermann Publishing Group developed its individual full-score layout in multicolor print. You're not going to believe this. As standard practice, the volumes of this both scholarly and practical edition are being published in print app hybrid editions, bilingual, English-German, and in pairs of component volumes. In the OR text volume, philologically based supplementations appear in red, performance practical editions in blue. Numbered red hand symbols refer the reader to the commentary, similar to footnotes. The explanations underlying the musical text include a comprehensive representation of the genesis of the work and transmission of the sources, advice concerning performance practice and questions of tempo, numerous tables, the commentary, as well as a glossary of the terms used by Bruckner, like Schnell and Longsam, like fast, slow, yeah, okay, fine. The source text volume, the pages of its musical text paginated identically to those of the or text, supplies all information relevant to the work's sources, presented in a unique, innovative, colored symbol layout. Good grief. I mean, first of all, that's there's, none of this is any big deal. Yes, the colored thing, I guess, is special, maybe. But that's not the point, because, because the point is every or text edition has what's known as a revisionsbericht. It has a critical commentary where you get source information, and they tell you what source they're using, and then they go through the whole thing bar by bar and tell you what they've done editorially or what options there have been, and you have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose to use option A or you can choose option B where options are available. Um, where they aren't, you don't. You just play what the guy wrote. Most of this symphony is just playing what the guy wrote. It really is. And if the options are to do something fortissimo rather than forte or do, you know, a slur here rather than a, you know, staccato there or whatever, the bottom line is that these kinds of choices are the meat and potatoes of what conductors do in rehearsal with the orchestra. How staccato is a staccato, whether you want to play something with, you know, more legato phrasing or less, whether you want to speed up here or slow down there. What the or text says is almost entirely irrelevant to what you are going to experience in an actual performance, taking into account the interpretation of the artists in question. That's a fact. You will never know the difference unless the, the differences are major. That is reorchestration, different instruments get different tunes, or, or there are major structural things like cuts or rearrangements of movements or chunks of things put somewhere else. That stuff you'll notice. But none of that is true of Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. None of it in any way that makes any difference. It's not. So, so what you're going to hear when you listen to this, I mean, I got to find the booklet, but it's down here somewhere. Excuse me. Hi there. Oh, there I am. Yes. Here it is. It's a piece of crap. Here it is. What you're going to hear is Bruckner Seventh. The same Bruckner Seventh you've heard your whole life, just like everybody else's Bruckner Seventh. And the, the interesting thing about it is that the interpretation of Maestro Rattle does make a difference because it's absolutely dreadfully dull. It's terrible. It's a reading rehearsal. That's what it is. It is not a fully formed conception of the piece. I, I can't fault Rattle for his choice of tempi. They're normal for this symphony. But the playing of the orchestra is so tired and bored and boring. It's just unbelievable. One of the things that really kind of 
blows my mind in this performance is the sound of the brass section. I mean, the LSO has a wonderful brass section, but Rattle seems to have decided, maybe because of his experience with the Berlin Philharmonic, that he wants the orchestra to adopt a Germanic type sound. That is a, a dark, thick, congealed, sort of mushed together, almost carrion-like agglomeration, of, uh, not as good as carrion, mind you, uh, of, of, of brass timbres. Now that makes a huge difference in Bruckner, as you know. He does not want the brass ever to cover the strings, which they should <laughs> on many occasions. He wants, the at the end of the first movement, for example, I'll give you an example, where where the brass are going da 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 you know it's they're arpeggiating up and down you don't hear that you just hear it all sounds like one congealed thing you don't hear the parts moving you don't hear differentiation of timbres you don't hear these strata of instrumental sonorities the trumpets are terribly recessed for most of the performance they don't speak out with any brilliance when we get to the adagio oh my when we get to the adagio you know the adagio it has the cymbal crash it does but it's it's back there somewhere there's no brilliance. There's no excitement. It is the most limp-wristed climax to the adagio you have ever heard in your life. And an adagio, a Bruckner 7 adagio that has no climax, whether you have the symbols or not. I mean, you got to hear the trumpets come out of the texture. You've got I cannot believe that the Ortext edition says that the most important voice is the Wagner tubas at that climax, where the trumpets and everybody else, it's horrible. It just sounds tired and dull. The scherzo, oh my God. I mean, the climaxes of that, dum ba dum ba dum ba It should have rhythm. It should have articulation. It should have accent. I am sure Mr. Coors put those into his or text, or at least the option to put them into his or text if the artists so demand it. It's, it's a total fudge. It has no energy. It has no volume. The, the dynamic range throughout this performance is compressed. It goes from like mezzo something to mezzo something. And then, and then you get to the finale. I mean, those last stages of the finale where all kinds of weird stuff is happening, you know, the thing's inverted and it's up and down and right side up and, and all that fun stuff is going on. And you finally get that wonderful return to the climax of the, of the first movement. Um, in different rhythm, bum bum ba dum ba da da dum. I mean that rhythm, dum bum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum. Ba -dum you know, it's it's not there. It's <laughs> you just can't believe it. It's so bad. I mean, it's amateur hour. This is kid stuff, absolute kid stuff. There is no joy. In that ending, it has no humor. It has no, no, no transcendental anything. If that's what you think it should have, none of it's there. Trust me. So, so where are we with this bow wow of a performance? First of all, the addition is completely meaningless and irrelevant. The entire conception of having a one and only super fabulous ultra uber or text edition definitely deserves the white scarf of irredeemable hubris chutzpah. Chutzpah, hubris, take your pick. And the performance itself, oh my God. I mean, I probably should have gotten out my scarlet scarf of shame to go with the performance. It's just a total uninteresting run through. It has no redeeming qualities at all. Nothing that would justify its existence. And with all the great Bruckner sevens that are out there, it's really depressing. I really quite depressing and aggravating. So, need I say, don't get this. Don't waste your time. Unless you're one of those people who when I say something sucks, you automatically go buy it. In which case, knock yourself out. Pay double. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.